Welcome back to the Bayside Games Dev Vlog uh, tutorial series. We're creating a particle manager for our game, Robots Can't Jump. So let's continue. In the previous tutorial, we were just fleshing out the particle manager's methods. Um, so it's update, it's constructor, and most importantly, the add particle containers. So what we need to do now, now that we have initialized and created the update and render functions, is to actually update these particle containers. Um, this is very straightforward. I'll show you the method I use. Um, so we know that particle container list contains uh, just particle objects. So what we can do is we can grab the particle container out of that iterator just using the double dereference. So the first dereference gives us a pointer. The second dereference gives us a whole object or at least a reference to an object. And we can use that to just create a reference just for ease of use. We'll use that in both loops. And then each container should have its own little update function, just like that, and we pass the delta time in. Very simple. So it calls update for each child container. This is a very common pattern, so I do this, I do this all the time. And likewise with render. We just call render like that. That's it. That's all we need to do for this stuff. Okay, so one last thing we need to do is we have an add particle container function that looks fine. We don't have a remove particle container function yet. So remove particle container is a little bit different because what we need to do is we actually need to search for uh, this specified container in our list and then remove it from our list. And also we uh, need to destroy it. So actually add and remove is probably not the right name. I would say add and destroy particle container would be a better name because we actually want this to destroy the particle container too, not just remove it from our list. So it's a slightly more descriptive name. So it, it's quite a, quite a strong name, but we really do want it to delete this object. So it should no longer be accessible from this point. In fact, we'll put a comment. Um, removes container from the manager's list and calls operator to delete on it. The container can no longer be used from this point onwards. Just to make it very clear to whoever uses this function. Okay, so finding it is very straightforward. Um, first, we create an iterator for iterator i, and now we search for it using std find, which is in our which is a very simple algorithm function. Um, this is actually declared in algorithm.h. So what we need to do is just go back and just add that in as one of our includes. STL algorithm, very useful. It's got, it's got a bunch of stuff in there that you can use. And now we use std find. Why is it not happy with that one? Okay, so it's just arguments, that's fine. So what it wants is, um, it wants the first iterator. So that's in our list of particle containers, the begin. Very similar to the loop iterator, this function. In fact, it, internally it does a loop iteration too. And then we want the address of the container because our particles list stores pointers, if you recall correctly. So if you look at the particle control list's definition, it stores pointers, not whole objects. So this is going to return this is going to return to us an iterator. The iterator may or may not be um, the end of the list. So when it's the same as the end of the list, that means it couldn't find it. But when it's not the same as that, it means it did find it. We've got a valid iterator that we can use to then pull it out of the list. Um, this is just the way STL works. Um, it's a very common pattern when you're using STL to find things based on iterators. In fact, iterators are the only real way to um, move through and do stuff with a lot of um, STL data structures. So it's good to get used to this if you're going to do any C++. It's a very useful um, little library to use. It's used everywhere. Okay, so let's compare. So if I is n if this iterator is not equal to the end of the list, we can remove it. Otherwise, we have a very bad error. What we do is um, we just remove... And as you can see, um, there is a remove function here because of this type. But we can also use, just have another look. Um, what do we actually want to do is use arrays. So we're very lucky um, that this type that we use in the list, if you look closely, it's an STD list. The reason I'm using this whole iterator thing instead of just calling remove is that only STD list supports remove. Um, if you used, for instance, the uh, array functions or std uh, vector, for instance, they wouldn't support remove. It's just not there. It's um, really only supported by list. And the erase method is much more widely supported. So you can switch the container type for performance reasons very easily, trivially, if you use this pattern. 
so that's why I'm using it. So let's erase that. So erase, uh, you look, the function declaration looks scary, but all it really takes is just an iterator. So just check that that works. Okay, I'm just going to compile that because that, that looked a bit crazy, but effectively you have a list, you have an iterator somewhere that points to somewhere inside that list, one of the elements, then you erase it and that's all good and that removes it from the list. So we could have used remove, but this method is more compatible with other types. So if we had a binary tree, for instance, for some whatever reason, that would also work. You wouldn't have to change this piece of code. It's to defined is algorithmic, so it works on any type of container with this arrays. And internally, this is all that remove is doing anyway. So that's all good. Okay, so let's not linger too long on that. We have an add and remove, an add and destroy, that's great. Now, let's go and look a little bit more closely at our particle container class. Okay, so we looked at this in a previous tutorial. So what we have now is we have this list of particles and that's all fine and dandy. But what we need to do with each of these particles is we need to actually update it. One of the most important things uh, when you're developing a class like the particle container is to get it working in a very minimal fashion as soon as possible. In order to do that, we need to know a little bit more about what particle container does. And it's quite simple. Um, the particle container is just in charge of, of spawning particles within a set volume of space. Um, now that description is very vague. Um, that operation of spawning particles is a very complex operation because of the number of types of particles we have. So let's define a few things that are sort of common to all particles um, that will help us to flesh out this a little bit more and see how it works and how it runs. And I've noticed that we haven't really been commenting well enough and I really believe in strongly believe in commenting things so we're going to call this num particles the, um, the number of particles currently active in our list okay the max number of particles in our list list of particle objects Now we have to bear in mind that this list could con potentially contain hundreds or even thousands of particles. So we're gonna have to do a few tricks to um, make that adding and removing thing work well. And uh, I've got a few things up my sleeve that I've planned out and how that will work. Um, but let's think about data. Um, specifically, let's think about how we're going to define how our particles look. A particle container um, contains several pieces of data. This is very static data that doesn't really change much, which define how particles are spawned. Um, Good examples of this are things like the texture or the size of the particles or where they're spawned. Those are all crucial things. So it's very easy for us to define these. Um, the very first thing we need, obviously, is the position of this particle system. All particle systems have a position um, of one in one form or another. A very big particle system might not seem to have a position, but we need, uh, in order for our, our matrix maths later on to work well, we need a sort of a world space position in 3D where these particles are spawned from. So that's easy enough. We just use the built-in marmalade CIWVEC3. It's a fixed point vector class that can represent a world space easily enough. And we're just going to call this POS just for short. So this is the position in world space of the center of this particle system. All particle systems need this. Um, the other thing, um, that's sort of implicit along with the position is the total size of the particle system. That is defined uh, purely by uh, the particle spawning parameters, which we'll see later on. Like, we might give a very large random spawn radius and that'll sort of roughly define the radius. So there's no real need or reason to define the total radius. So we're not gonna do that. And the next thing we need is um, some very basic data. And that thing, though these are things like, um, you know, the um, the lifetime, the rough lifetime that we assign when particles are spawned. So very simply, um, we're going to use a lifetime in frames because it's easier and it just makes the maths a little bit easier. Um, but now that I think about it, uh, we're already doing some fixed point maths here, so we might as well use seconds. Okay, so the initial lifetime so this is the uh, initial lifetime in seconds assigned to newly spawned particles. Okay, 
Later on, uh, we're going to allow the, the user to have a random bias applied to this value, but for now, this will do okay. Uh, the random bias just makes the particle system look more interesting, but it's not vital, so we leave it out for now. Let's tidy these up a little bit. It's starting to look good. Uh, we have pos the position of the center of the system, which is good, and we have initial lifetime. And another thing we are going to need is um, a spawn radius. So I'm going to, once again, just use a, a fixed for that. So the spawn radius will be used in our calculations, probably combined with some sort of random bias. So it's like, it essentially defines a sphere centered around this world space point where your particles can be spawned. Um, centered on impulse. So that's quite easy. These are these are good good. Um, we can work with these for now. And what I'm going to do is in the particles themselves. I'm just going to hard code for now things like the texture and color and stuff, just so we can get something running. We'll do some basic behaviors in the particles. Then later on, we'll start making them look fancy. But this should be enough for now. Um, we're not going to have a lot of variations in here. And what I think I might actually do is convert these things to floats. Because I'm actually planning on converting the whole engine to use floats and not these these variables. So we'll just turn them into floats for now. And one other consideration we need to take is that um, these these variables they look um, pretty static to me. I think the position may change over time. So um, for instance, I'll give you an example of a rocket. Uh, a rocket ha ejects particles from itself, so the center of the particle system changes rapidly over time. But the position of the rocket changes rapidly too. So we need to allow the user to change the center of this particle system's position. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create a set pause function. That will allow the user. So that sets the center of this particle system. So particles that have already been emitted won't be affected by set pause. Um, their matrix maths will be affected slightly, but the final result is that they won't move. But new, newly spawned particles will base their position on the center of this plus a random bias. So that's quite important. It will allow us to do some pretty special effects. Um, this might actually change every frame. And once we actually th start thinking about this, um, we need to think about, do we want to actually set this up in the constructor? And I think the answer is yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to provide a way to do that in the constructor too. So we want the user to be able to just construct this object with a minimum amount of fuss and having to force them to call this potentially random function every time something is constructed is not a good use case. So we'll just call that position. Okay, so let's um, add these things in. And for this reason, I'm not going to make this a constant, but these two can very easily be constant. I doubt we're going to change these variables ever once the particle system is created. They're sort of pretty pretty static uh, variables. They don't really change much. Okay, that's great. So we need to initialize all of these. So let's stick them into the constructors initializer list. They are the first things after num particles. Okay, and immediately you see this is the benefit of using this const design pattern. As soon as I do this, I can see that I'm actually going to have to allow the user to specify these things in the constructor. Otherwise, I cannot initialize them. So let's do that. And it makes a lot of sense to be able to specify these guys in the constructor actually on second thoughts because they don't really change. So that's good. And we're starting to get quite a few arguments here. So there's uh, almost beginning to be a good argument for splitting up all of these variables into some sort of uh, separate struct, which we may do later on. Um, even better, I may allow the user to actually just pass that in as a constant. But we're getting there, we're getting there. Okay, so we just have to copy in these into the constructor and the position. And we're almost out of time for this video. Oh, but we're nearly there. And we'll just rename them. Okay, I'll finish this up in the second video, but thanks for watching and be sure to watch the next part so you can see how we implement these and start testing the system.